Suzanne P. versus Joint Board of Directors. Please, the court, I would like to uh, reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Two? Two minutes. Yes. I'd like to uh, welcome this court to Buffalo and to thank you for uh, saving us and counsel in this case from making the trip to Albany. Uh, this is our re-argument, and I hope we can uh, answer some questions uh, that came up uh, during the first argument better this time around than last. Uh, I think I'll start off with, with the questions that was raised. Uh, what is the joint board and, uh, and what are the Erie and Wyoming County soil and conservation water districts? Well, all three were created by acts of the legislature in the 1940s to do with uh, uh, flood control issues regarding uh, Buffalo Creek and its tributaries. And the joint board was created because Buffalo Creek uh, extended into both Erie and Wyoming counties, so it was in part of two districts. So a joint, joint district was created in order for the Erie and Wyoming uh, county uh, districts to have one entity with which to deal with the federal government in, in uh, contracting with it to have a, a various flood control and water uh, erosion, I mean, soil cons so issues. Can, at, uh, counsel, can I, can I ask you, counsel, uh, is there evidence in the record, if so, what evidence, about who currently does own the land on which the dams sit? I, well, the answer, I think the answer is yes, but in this case, though. Well, but, but could you tell me what, who does own it and, and where the evidence is? That would be helpful. Well, that evidence was not presented during the trial, and it was not presented during the trial because there were easements obtained from the original owners going all the way back to the 1950s pursuant to the, the December 1959 agreement. And uh, unlike what was represented during the, the prior argument, this, uh, the actual language regarding easements went not only to access to the property at, after the construction, but those easements were a precondition for the construction happening in the first place. Uh, during the trial of this action, Mr. Gaston a director for the Erie District testified that the, these dams, which were known as the Ursang Sills, were called that because when the original adjoining landowner was on Mr. Ursang, from whom the easements were, were, were uh, obtained. So the issues that were raised regarding, well, who owned the underlying land were taken care of by the fact of these easements. Which, without which these these uh, these low head dams would never have been constructed. So, so is your position that ownership of the dams runs with the ownership of the permanent easement? It, the easement, I mean, the ownership is is structured based upon the 1984 uh, operating operation and maintenance district, where I think. He's, the, the ownership was split between the joint board and, and an arm of the federal government with the joint board res, being responsible for operation and maintenance and the federal government being responsible for design of the dam and uh, maintaining the overall structure of it. Was that your, uh, was that the directed verdict at trial that both the joint board and the federal government were the owners of the dam? Well, the, the, the only issue was whether the joint board was an owner. And based upon the agreement and the testimony of Mr. Gaston, it was held that the, the joint board was an owner of these low head dams. An owner? Yes. Leaving open the possibility that there could be one or more yes. other owners? I mean, in, in a number of cases that have been previously before this court, like labor law 240 and 241 cases, they've been held to be like multiple owners. And in fact, in one of the cases that was relied upon by the appellate division, the Metro Media case, there were like multiple owners involved with the ownership of this elevated rail station 
in particular, and, and then uh, there was a separate owner who was held to be an owner of real property regarding this uh, advertising frame, which was at issue. That even though that the owner of the advertising frame had no connection, did not own the underlying land, and did not even own the rest of the structure, it was still held to be an owner of the particular structure that was issued in that case. And I would say that the, the same would apply here, that the, that the joint board is an owner of the underlying structure and, and would therefore, for purposes and of operation what makes and therefore would have the do counselor, to provide warnings. What makes, what evidence is there that it is the joint board that owns. Why do you come to that conclusion, and what supports? On the basis of the of the 1984 uh, operation and maintenance contract that was executed on behalf of the joint board, and and the prior similar uh, uh, similar contracts going back to uh, 1959. And the other party that was uh, a part of that execution, it's the federal it, government. It was a, a, an arm of the federal government. And what did, the, what did the federal government do as a result of that agreement, in your view? Well, it, it designed and constructed the dams. No, what did the agreement provide for? Well, the... the, the as to ownership. Well, the, 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 the agreement stated that title would vest in the joint board upon the completion of the dams and uh, it would continue to vest in the joint board. So, so is it your view it that the original purpose? Council, is it your view then that the federal government conveyed to them an ownership interest in the structure itself? According as as was found by Justice Grisanti, by the way the, the the agreement was structured, that once that was completed, title to the dams vested automatically in the joint board. I'm still, as last time, trying to understand the legal status of these various entities. So let me just start with the two water, soil and water conservation districts, the Wyoming and the Erie County districts. Um, soil and water conservation district law section 9 says that district or soil and water conservation district means a county whose board of supervisors by resolution declared such county to be a soil and water conservation district. So I read that to say that the district is the same legal entity as the county. That may not be correct, but if it's correct or not correct, I'd like to know what you think. Well, as I think it's been pointed out in the briefs, the, the Erie District and the Wyoming District were created by acts of the legislature in the 1940s. So I, I think that this, the but are they the same legal are they the same would, legal entity as the county? That's the question. Yeah, that, that they were they were created as, as as entities, legal entities, but by the same token, the, the joint board itself is nothing but. I'm just trying to stick with the conservation districts for the moment. Are they the same legal entity as the county? Because that's the way the section of the soil and water conservation law that I read reads to me. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't know. I do not believe that's entirely correct. I think there is a separate board that was created, and that the directors of which uh, the Erie District and the Wyoming District comprise the joint board and govern everything it does. And I'm still not asking about the joint board yet. But, but again, I do not think that if you're asking that is the county in and of itself the Erie District. I think the short answer is no. Okay. And do you have any authority for that? There, well, there are, there are statutes that created the, the, the actual Erie District and the Wyoming District. Do you know what the those? creation of the Joint Board? I'm not asking about the Joint Board again. Is, which statutes are those? Well, they, they were acts of the legislature. I do not have the actual. Okay. I mean, I think they, they've been cited in various briefs, but. Okay. So let me, let me go back to this question about uh, the ownership of the dam. Was it necessary for the federal government, you say the federal government transferred that ownership to the joint board. Was it necessary for the federal government to have ownership in the property 
right, the property on either side of that dam to be able to convey ownership in the dam? My understanding is that the fact of the permanent easements obtained by the joint board would, would negate the need for the federal government itself to have any, any ownership interest in the underlying land. Why, why is that? How does the well, uh, easement get that, you to that's ownership just the way the in the whole structure? Transaction was structured that. Well, the easement. Before anything I'm sorry, could me, happen, but the joint e board would, would get the easements from the landowners. Right, but okay. So let's talk about the easements. I understood the easements to give a right of way to build the structure and then to also maintain that structure. Yes. Okay, but that that is not about ownership of the land at all. No. The easement doesn't do that. And it's not about ownership of the thing that is constructed, in this case, the dam. So how does the easement get the federal government to have an interest that allows it to transfer that interest, that what we're calling the right of ownership, in the dam to the joint board? Well, I think it's more to the, the, the way the the responsibilities of the federal government versus the joint board are structured. Okay. That the, the federal government is re responsible for the maintaining the, the structure and, if necessary, re reconstructing it, as has happened in this case in the 1980s, where the subject dam was reconstructed by the federal government. And the federal government was responsible for designing the dam. But on the other hand, the day-to-day -day maintenance of the dam was responsible the responsibility of the joint board. I see. So then your position is that the federal government owned the dam because they helped it, it build and fund the, the dam? Of, of maintaining the I mean, the overall structure of the dam, I would say. Well, why wouldn't it be just as reasonable, sorry, Judge Garcia, <laughs> to reach a conclusion like the jury did that the joint board doesn't own the dam because uh, you know, the, the Joint Board couldn't really do much without the approval of uh, NCRS. You know, they fund the project, they hire the contractors. If I own my home and I want to do work on it, I don't have to go to anyone else to ask for permission or to ask for the funds. So why, why isn't that a reasonable interpretation? Um, and why shouldn't we say that, let's leave the jury verdict alone, and if you want to, you can appeal from that? Because, the, the, again, the responsibilities for this dam were structured according to this agreement. And operation and maintenance w was held to be the responsibility of the joint board. So I would say that under this agreement, the quote-unquote ownership of this dam was split by virtue of the various responsibilities for it. Let me ask that a, a different way, if I could. And correct me if I'm wrong on the procedure here. But, and, and with respect to the joint board, there's a summary judgment motion which is denied, right? Summary judgment is denied as to the joint board, right? Yes. So there's an issue that needs to go to the jury. That issue goes to the jury on ownership, and the jury finds against you, your client, right? Yes. Then the trial judge directs a verdict despite that jury verdict in your favor. Yes. Correct? Then it goes up to the appellate division, and the appellate division directs a verdict in their favor, right? Yes. Doesn't all of this suggest, including the denial of summary judgment, that this, and given the discussion here on who owns what and what agreement, that this was a jury issue? I would say no, Your Honor, because of the rationale the appellate division used for uh, setting aside uh, the Judge Grisanti's directed verdict, it, it really moved the goalposts from where they were before the trial. But after the first appeal in 2019, after the trial, they suddenly uh, added this new criteria that we had to prove that the owner of the dam owned the underlying land. And they cited the Metromedia case. But if you really study the Metro Media case, it come, you come to the complete opposite conclusion. Because the, the property owner that was at issue, the owner of the uh, advertising frames, did not own the underlying land. And, and, and they said that, well, that was OK, based upon the way that the parties had structured 
the ownership of the overall uh, the uh, elevated rail stations that they had structured as such that that this one company would be a considered an owner of real property with respect to the advertising frames, even though it was not an owner of the underlying lands. And that theory that you're saying the appellate division went on, was that given to the jury? No, that was something that, well, there was arguments made about that during the trial, but that was something that was not really put to the jury in that respect. And, it was only that it was the uh, it was the appellate division itself that had introduced the Metro Media case into this case. It was, it was not something that any of the parties had brought up. Was the jury instructed that to find the joint board liable, the joint board would have to be the owner? Well, the actual trial was only conducted upon the issue of ownership in and of itself. That was the only issue before the jury was whether the joint board was an owner. But you had asserted claims that were based against other entities that were based on a theory other than ownership. Well, the, we have presented a claim uh, of, regarding the, the town of West Seneca that as an adjoining owner with special knowledge of a non-obvious uh, uh, danger, uh, which uh, could be accessed from its property, it would have a duty to warn under this, this court's decision in but the But also, Rundo I think your, your claims against Erie and Wyoming County are also based not on their ownership. Is that right? Well, the Erie and Wyoming districts, we are saying that they you should... Also, I'm sorry, you sued, you sued the... Well, the Erie County, there, there's two arguments we make. One under the environmental conservation law that they basically assumed a duty of an, of an owner because they contracted for maintenance of this dam with the uh, Erie District. And that if, if, so they have assumed a duty of an owner by basis of the fact that they, they assumed a contract for the maintenance of the, of the thing, and, and therefore they should be held to be an, an owner. But our second theory was, was based upon the fact that they st stood in the way of warnings being posted regarding the dangers of these dams by the Joint Board in the town of West Seneca. Right, so ju just to get to the end of what I was trying to ask, you're, uh, you do have other theories that are not based on ownership, but those weren't tried to the jury because those defendants had been granted summary judgment before you got to the jury. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And, those, and you're appealing those here? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Jeremy Toth for uh, the municipal entity known as Erie County. And I'd also like to welcome you to Erie County and welcome you to the Erie County Soil and Water Conservation District, because I've spent the last nine months contemplating your question, me, Justice Wilson, and I think I have an answer. I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, so so you, you point out that the, the definitional section says that a district Soil and Water Conservation District means a county whose Board of Supervisors. But what I take that to mean is that the, it's the geographical location. It is not the municipal entity known as Erie County. And I have a few, few um, sources for that. Later in the statute, two places, Section 5 and Section 6, it, uh, in Section 5 it says, when the Board of Supervisors dot, 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 declares the county to be a soil and water conservation district, as if the Board of Supervisors is proclaiming all of Erie County is now part of the Lake Erie watershed, and we are pro proclaiming every inch of Erie County to be part of this water conservation district. It is not saying that Erie County is the soil and water conservation district and that the soil and water conservation district is the county. It's saying, we are saying for public policy purposes, we are declaring this all to be water conservation, and then we are going to establish a board of directors to manage it. But that process is a separate and distinct entity. Section 6 also says, when a county has been declared a soil and water conservation district. There's also a case from the third department, which I cited in my, my um, 
my brief, which relies on an opinion from the Attorney General from 1980. It has to do with the employment status of an employee of one of the soil and water conservation districts. So it's not directly on point, but I think the analysis is the same. And the Attorney General in 1980 said that it is a distinct entity. Finally, what I would say to answer your question is that in practice, throughout upstate New York, this is how they have been operated, as separate and distinct legal entities that can be sue or be sued. And it would be a fairly dramatic change if this court were to determine that they were interchangeable. And so that is how I answer your question, okay. Justice. That's, that's a thorough answer. Okay. Counsel, can I just clarify on that first part of your answer? I, I take it that you're, what you're saying is that county refers uh, to a geographic nomer versus county as the government structure. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Right. So that, um, and, and this happens quite frankly in my in my office a lot, where we get we get named in a lawsuit because something happened in Erie County, even though we had nothing to do with it. Um, and I think the statute, as I read it, with the third department case, with the attorney general opinion, that's you know that's a lot of. Uh, dominoes, I think, dominoes. It's a lot of bricks to undo um, um, at this point, 80 years down the road. The other thing I would, would add, a um, lot of discussion about the easements. It's my understanding, and I think it was you, Justice Singas, who asked us if the easements were in the record, and they're not. There's testimony about the easements, but the easements themselves, and they were, they are on NICIF, but they are not in the record before this court. And I'm not sure why, because the county was out of this case years ago. Um, we were not involved in the trial. So- Well, thank you, because I too have been thinking about that for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, 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 it's difficult, I think, at this point, at this appellate level, to discuss in detail easements that are not part of the record. Do, and to, do you have a position, counsel, if, if warnings were appropriate, who was responsible for providing them? I uh, submit to this day that uh, that counsel that was given long before I worked for the county attorney's office was accurate because it was not either the county or the Erie County Soil and Water Conservation District or the joint board of directors. Okay, so so then who was it though if it if in your you, it was none of those entities. So under if we if we have something that requires a warning here. I'm not saying we do, but if we do, who needs to provide it? My understanding based on sort of centuries old riparian rights is that when in doubt, the state is responsible for navigable waterways within its limit. This is a navigable waterway. Clearly it's unclear who owns the structure, but I think we can say with certainty that the water that flows over that structure. What about the, the bed? And, I, and the bed underneath is the responsibility of the state. So your view is that the riparian rights doctrine extends to the bed as well as the water itself? And that's based on um, some Supreme Court decisions, some uh, old uh, Court of Appeals and New York State decisions, but um, in the uh, state of America, the state of Alaska, this is from 1997, United States Supreme Court, referencing an opinion from 1849, essentially, not essentially, they say, a court deciding a question of title to the bed of a navigable water must begin with a strong presumption against defeat. So what title. did the federal government contract to give? I think they just installed a dam and said, joint board, you operate it, you maintain it as a dam. And that's another critical piece of information. This dam still exists. So did they have ownership rights? No, I don't believe they did. And if they did, I think those ended once it was permanently affixed in a state navigable waterway. Could, so they could not give ownership by the agreement? I don't believe they could. Once it's affixed to that navigable waterway and the bed, and 
clients here, all they have is an easement to maintain, not just, the easements are not just for the structure. The easements were created to have access to the river from one end of Erie County to the other. They were not just for the structure, and they still exist so that the clients here can perform. So who owns the structure? I'm sorry? Who owns the dam? I believe when, when push comes to shove, it has to be the state because there is no other clear owner. It's just not, I mean, here we are. So based on that answer, do you support or dispute the uh, appellate division holding, the 2021 appellate division holding, uh, which suggests or says that the once affixed to the land that the structures run with the land? I think that makes the most sense, certainly in this case. There might be, I mean, there might be situations where a- Why isn't it treated as a trade fixture? I'm sorry? Why isn't it treated as a fixture, an exception that it would run with the land? Because I, I because it's been there for 80 years, it's not moving, and I just, it, it, it was built by the federal government, and quite frankly, the federal government said, okay, our job is So is here. the owner of the land then res to be responsible? Was that the intent of the government? I, yeah. I don't know what the intent of the federal government was. But, That's what I'm asking. Right. I, but what I would say is that if the intent of the federal government was to walk away from ownership of this structure, then the only arguable owners left are either the state of New York or the private landowners who have deeds to the middle of the river. That's, that's not the agreement. We heard that the agreement that the federal government entered into was to convey title upon completion to the joint board. Is that not accurate? No, that's what it says, but I don't think that that is an effective way or a legal way. Well, to, effective doesn't really matter, but legal does. I don't believe that without having a, uh, a, an interest in the land or at least articulating in that agreement something to do with navigable waterways, the bed, the water flowing over it, that a, so then a one by, sentence in an agreement. By what authority then, if, if they don't own it, how did it get there? Are, are you saying it just magically appeared and they, they could just do this? Why? I mean, I, w I would say it's, it would be similar to if it was a private entity building something on somebody else's land. That doesn't make it... Okay. But it, did the landowners sign an agreement? Right. The landowners did not... Okay, so not. then you're saying that they're trespassers, not on the easement, right? We got the easement even though we don't see what the easement is. Let's just work with there's a valid easement. No one's saying they somehow uh, uh, violated the easement in the construction and maintenance. But, I mean, what, they're trespassing by having the dam? Somebody's got to now get rid of the dam because they're trespassing? Well, I think, again, I would then, and, and it does, I mean, I, I understand it goes round and round, but then I would, I, I would, I would suggest that, uh, and, and, and I don't think anybody's suggesting that the private landowners would have responsibility here, but I think they have more responsibility. Why not if it's a fixture? Well, because then I think it goes back to the to the sort of fundamental basics, basics, the fundamental understandings of what a navigable waterway but those, is. Those cases, Council, that you're referring to, I thought they were cases where the state, you know, retained some involvement in the project. Are there any cases that you're aware of where there's something on a bed and the state, so far as I can tell, the state's had no involvement in this project from the record to date, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And, and so the notion that the state is somehow responsible because pursuant to an agreement that they're not party to, someone built something on the bed of a navigable water doesn't seem obvious to me. So that's why I'm wondering if you can point to any cases that holds the state responsible and as the owner effectively under riparian rights where they, they don't have any participation? Uh, no is the answer. I cannot. But I would push back a little bit. The, the state created the system of soil and water but, but are they a party to, I didn't see them as a party to any of the agreements in the, in the record unless I mean They are not a party. To, but, but using that same theory, neither is the County of Erie and neither are the two soil and water conservation districts. Um, 
can Erie County be held liable through its involvement in the operating agreement? Well, my answer is no. And, and so <laughs> I, I don't that believe is, that is assuming it, well, let's assume it's not an owner. Mm -hmm. Can can liability attach uh, on a tort theory? I, I, I don't believe so. I don't I don't know how you would attach it. Um, or on a third party beneficiary of the contract theory. I mean, if you were, you know, the county and all municipal governments um, spend their money with outside entities and not-for-profits, private individuals, and if all of that money starts attaching potential liability, that too, I would suggest, is a pretty, pretty significant departure from the way we've understood uh, how it is municipal entities can spend their money by giving it to independent entities, which is what we did here. So what, we have a contract where the federal government purports to convey an interest to the joint board in the structure. What evidence is it that they had no right to do that? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not, it's not a, I would call it, it's an operation and maintenance agreement, and I think, I think that's, you know, that's a distinction, and I think they are saying we're going to build this as a dam, and you, joint board, are going to make sure it keeps working as a dam. Yeah, but if they don't own it, which I think is what you're saying, if they don't own the dam, what could it possibly matter that they authorize someone else to take care of the dam they, if they don't own it? Couldn't the owner of the dam the next day say, you're trespassing, you can't touch my dam? Well, in this case, if you follow my theory, it, it would be the state, um, and I, you know, the state I think would have had. But the state course, who's not a party to the agreement. The state who's not a party to the agreement, but who has exercised and created the quasi-governmental entities that are. And the landowner, the landowners are not parties to the agreement, correct? The landowners are not part of this agreement. That's also correct. When you say, I'm sorry, when you say landowners, you're referring to the adjacent land? Because your, your argument is that the state is the landowner under its riparian rights, correct? Well, my argument is the county of Erie is not the owner. And then that leads <laughs> us to this discussion Anybody about else who might. is. Yeah. And the best I'm just I curious, when you say with. the owners are not party to the agreement, are you referring to the state? which obviously is not a party to the agreement, or to some other group of owners who might be adjacent to the dam? I mean, I, I believe I, I, I take uh, Justice's question to mean the, um, the private landowners where, where the deed marks go to the center of the river. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, what is the impact of those, of those actual deeds, those meets and bounds? And, and I think my argument, uh, is that because it is a navigable waterway that the state maintains ownership despite those deeds. So even though the dotted line goes to the middle of the creek, the real ownership interest ends at the bank. That would be my, that's my reading of, of, of the case law. Um, thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, um, Cole Hammond on behalf of the town of West Seneca. I can't tell this illustrious court who owns the dam, but I can tell you who doesn't. <laughs> it seems to be a common thread here. <laughs> well, he's got to own it. And the issue then becomes, is there some duty on the part of the town of West Seneca to give some sort of warning to the general public about the possible hazards involved in this flood control dam? And as the case law has been submitted, the the key is ownership. If you have some sort of ownership or control over the dam, then you may have a duty to give notice to casual trespassers upon the dam of the potential dangers. The other way you could be considered as having a duty of giving notice is if you've done something to perhaps enhance the danger or you demonstrated so something. So in your assessment, was the federal government in a position to convey anything with respect to the structure? I would, itself, not the land. 
Well, Your Honor, the town of West Seneca was not a party to those agreements. There are, there are no responsibilities with regards to maintenance of the, uh, the dams or construction or repair of the dams. And we're a separate entity. This is simply a dam that exists on town boundaries. And I don't think there's any responsibility in the town. The so whatever rights they had, it doesn't affect you because you didn't have anything to do with it. That's absolutely correct, Your Honor. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll sit down. Thank you. He's the court, Mark De La Posta. On behalf of the joint board. Council, can I ask you the same question I asked your colleague? If your position is that you are not responsible for any warnings that might be appropriate, um, who is? Well, you assume that the NCRS or the federal government is the owner of the structure. Um, and my client only has the ability to maintain and inspect the structure. I would, I would say that it's the federal government that has the duty. So even though under the agreement you assume responsibility for maintenance, your view is that that would not extend to providing a warning? Yeah, the, 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 the scope of what I can do or my client can do is very, very limited. If you want to do anything outside of that, which I would submit includes warnings, you would have to get permission from the federal government. But I take it there was no effort to obtain any permission. I mean, it's, it's not as if, as if there was some uh, attempt made that, that was thwarted by the federal government. Over the years, it's my understanding, there were many issues with the federal government that were addressed. Sorry, let me ask a better question. Is there anything in the record which suggests that with respect to this particular dam and whatever drowning risk there might have been, that there was an effort made to seek any permission to post a warning from the federal government. Not that I'm aware of, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Council, can I ask you, Council, I'm sorry, here, yes. uh, a procedural question also. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to understand what exactly is here. So there's a directed verdict against your client, and you appeal that, yes. right? My understanding of, and there's a jury verdict, but there's a directed verdict against you. Jury verdict for you, directed verdict against. That goes to the appellate division. The appellate division I'm assuming by what they do, undoes the directed verdict and directs a verdict for you. Yes. So it seems to me, let's say hypothetically, if we were to reverse the directed verdict, no court has considered if, whether or not the jury verdict was appropriate. Because here's the follow-up to that. If you're reviewing a jury verdict, the standard would be the party receiving the verdict gets every inference that can be drawn, right? So if we review a legal issue of ownership outside the jury verdict, would we be applying the wrong standard? I think, and my second point in my brief is that if you don't find that this is ripe for a directed verdict, that I believe you can reinstate the jury's verdict. Now, it may be procedurally that you would have to send it back uh, to the trial court to have an appeal or a review of that jury verdict and whether that was warranted and whether there was any rational basis for it in the record. Right. No one's ever done that, no. as far as I can tell. No, we never got to that point because the judge immediately after the jury's verdict directed the verdict against my client. So that's where that ended in the state court, went to the appellate division. And again, because it seems to me reviewing a jury verdict is a very different standard for us. Right? And hearing a jury verdict would be, is there support, whatever, giving every inference the party receive the verdict, not kind of a de novo review of documents to see who is an owner. No, I, I, I think I think the directed verdict is obviously a higher standard that I right. believe I met, and the appellate division agreed with that, but a lower standard is the ra whether there's a rational basis or anything in the record to support that verdict. It gives wide discretion, and you're right, that has not been considered by an appellate court yet. What, um, what if any different evidence, let me put it that way, was submitted 
at, to the jury different from the summary judgment? There really was no different evidence. There were the pictures, there was the agreement, and the deposition testimony of Mark Gaston, which was submitted in the summary judgment motion. The court, uh, in, at the trial, it was slightly different because his, his testimony was slightly different. Live testimony. And that, and, that, uh, and that was the basis for it. So that's the only change, really, is the, whatever he testified to, which was slightly different. So the consistent. difference, but also the live testimony. I'm sorry? Also that it's live testimony as opposed to just reading it off the page. I couldn't understand. What? I'm sorry. Also that it's live testimony yes. as opposed to reading it off the page, which includes sort of credibility determinations in that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So the and, issue and, here really isn't whether you are entitled to summary judgment, right? The issue is were you entitled to the jury verdict? Is there a rational, reasonable basis for it, right? I mean... The summary judgment motion was just a denial based on the papers. The review of the jury verdict would be based on the testimony and the exhibits, et cetera, right? Exactly. In the summary judgment motion, they said I hadn't gone far enough to disprove the plaintiff's entitlement to a verdict. Uh, the, I've, as Norm Crosby would say, now we're at trial, the burden is on the other foot. So in this case, he, the plaintiff, or, has to has to make that proof and and the jury concluded that they didn't make that proof and the appellate division agreed with that you so who owns the dam who owns I the know dam you don't, uh, no you know your client doesn't own the dam that's your view who owns the dam you agree that it's the state i, I think it has to be the state because it's on <laughs> riverbed riparian rights and the navigable waterway so if the state owns the dam what interest did the feds have to convey? Doesn't that mean the state had to convey interest to you? Correct. So what interest did you get from the feds? If they don't own the dam. I don't believe. Uh, so then are you trespassers every time you go and I don't check think on they, the dam? All they, we have is basically an agreement to maintain it uh, for them and inspect it. Yes, but if they have no interest in it. They have no real property interest. They have no... Not because it's a, a fixture. Of is there some other interest based on this federal um, uh, flood control uh, um, process that we're going through for decades, which is in part why you have this particular structure? I, I'm sorry. There's something else beyond, I mean, we're looking at this in a very discreet way. What are these agreements? What are these particular parties? But of course, this is against the backdrop of a large larger project from the federal government. So I'm wondering if there might be any particular interest this that draws from that for the feds and or the state. Well, I, I, as Mr. Toth pointed out, I think the state sort of got this all started by establishing these conservation, soil and water conservation districts. So to that extent, they have some interest in it, not ownership. But I'm saying isn't that because as a federal um, a flood control project going on throughout the country. No, which is, I mean, there's the state's part of that in terms of a partnership, but not, not directly. But I, I would want to point out one thing, Your Honors, on, on the Metro Media case. Um, I think that case is very distinguishable, and here's why. Uh, that contract that was drafted between Metro Media and, and the owners was very specific in that this sign was uh, attached and that at the conclusion of the lease, the owners could tell them to get that off of there, and it could be removed in one day, and it's, and it's uh, attached with nuts and bolts. Here we have a dam that well, is you not think, But you think that the state is the owner and presumably could remove it if it wanted to? Well, I guess anything can be done, but I, I, the sign is removable. It can be put up somewhere else. I mean, it's not like a pole or a pipe. It's something you'd never be able to use it again. You, you, you got to take it out, and that's why it's attached to the party, attached to the property, and part of the property. But so, so if I'm understanding you correctly, there are a number of flood control mechanisms in various riverbeds, streams, creeks around the state. And your view is that the state owns all of those and is responsible for policing them and making sure that there are no hazards and proceeding accordingly and can take them out if they want to do that? I, that seems to all flow from your ownership theory. Well, I don't know, other than the five dams in this river, 
what those other agreements okay, say. Okay, well, we could stick with, with the five dams here, but, but the state, without any prior participation that's reflected in the record anyway, um, was responsible for all these decades for making sure that it was safe and it was not creating any hazard to the community and could take it out, I assume, if it chose to do so? It chose to do so, yes. So, I, I, I would so, guess that might surprise the state to know that. Well, I, I still think that the, that the federal government, as owner of the structure itself, which is part of the property, uh, and, and the fact that they're contracting with us to maintain it, I think it's the federal government that has the final say on what to do. So with respect to the joint boards back in 1959, is it fair to say that they did obtain the easement for the agreement with the federal government? Yes, the easements were obtained. So why would they obtain the easement if they have no rights or responsibilities that were conveyed? There, uh, if you look at the soil and water uh, law, they're an agent of the federal government to, for purposes of getting these easements. So did the federal government own the structure then? I think they own, I think, I think if this contract had been structured differently, like in the Metro Media case, they could have structured it such that they own just the structure and what you're saying they didn't so they couldn't convey it to the board exactly it, it, it's it's a package deal the way it's set up this this and this so now it sounds well, like you're saying that the reusability of the fixture doesn't actually make a difference it's just what's in the contract right the contract controls i think here and and we have a duty just to do what's under the contract we aren't the owner and unless we're an owner public policy wise we have no ability to make changes or do anything to make it safer it's not our responsibility. That's not, we can't do that. Council, did, did the jury determine, I don't know the answer to this, but did the jury determine who owned the, who was the owner, or did they just determine you were not the owner? And the, the, the way the verdict sheet was structured was, was the joint board an owner of the project? And we argued over that, but that's how it was, it came out, and that was the decision that they made. So let me just clarify. Did I hear you correctly that you said the federal government owns the structure? I think they built it, they designed it, yes. put it onto a piece of property. Yes. To the extent it's a fixture to the property, then it's a package deal. But I think the federal government could have, but they didn't, write a better agreement such that just the structure itself, not the land, was transferred to us. And before it became they could have a done fixture, a lot of things they didn't. Council, before it became a fixture to the property, I guess. It would be. It, it was a trespass on the on the property. I don't think they were trespassing because they had the ability under the easement to go on the property. Well, the easement provides you the the right of passage to the to the dam, but the land upon which it's affixed is, I believe, you said the state's land. It is the state's land. So that sounds like a trespass to me. It, as Mr. Toth said, there's sort of some circular arguments that go on here. It, it, you never get to the end of it just because there's so many different moving parts and, and not a great answer. I might, be, I might be misunderstanding, but, but I thought you said that the state owns, under the case law, the riverbed and, and has riparian rights to the water. Yes. And if your view is that, and, and maybe, maybe it's not, but... If your view is that a fixture runs with the land, then I would think that would mean that the state would be the owner of the dam and not the federal government. What am I missing there? Under real property law, riparian law, that is correct. I'm saying that they could have structured it differently like they did in the Metro Media case and say, we're going to, for purposes of this agreement with whomever it is, we're going to separate those two things out. They could have done that or tried to do it. They didn't do any of that. They just said, real property, including fixtures, it's yours. But they didn't have the right to do that. And just going back to one of Judge Halligan's questions for a minute, what is your basis for believing you have to get the federal government's permission to put up warning signs? This, if, if you read over that three-page agreement plus the five mm -hmm. pages of standards, the scope of that agreement is so comprehensive in terms of we have to get permission to do anything, anything. They don't give you permission to do anything other than inspect and report to us if there's any problem. When you say That's to, all we can do. When you say to do anything to the dam, right. right, 
But what about signage on the riverbank? I think if you read that contract, it. Okay, so the, the answer is it's in, the contract is what requires that. Yeah, the okay. contract prohibits us from doing anything. They don't want us to do anything. We're just at their beck and call. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Justin Hendricks on behalf of the Erie County Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, I'd like to pick up first with that question about the trespass issue, if the riparian rights should hold and the underlying bed should be New York State's property. Um, I, I think that it's not a trespass in large part because New York State specifically created the joint board in 1949 to take federal monies and do what was necessary in the Buffalo Creek watershed. It is not a very long law that created the joint board. So it was something like a, it was something like a license from the state? Uh, perhaps. I, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what the title of the conveyance was, but the Buffalo Creek watershed is specifically stated in the Chapter 374 law. So there is no question that the legislature knew that they were creating a joint board whose purpose was to do the acquiring of monies from the federal government and then spending that money. So I think that the argument can be made that New York State is not, in this case, can't speak to any others, some unknowing owner of various dams throughout New York State. Um, here, they, they, can, they asked that this happen, and it did. So then can the agreement with the feds be seen as the state through the joint, oh, uh, let me put it this way, the joint board as a state's agent, sounds like what you're suggesting, I may misunderstand you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, is then accepting the ownership, recognizing the ownership, I, I, and simply has negotiated maintenance. I, I, I believe that the agreement as counsel for the joint board just detailed is an incredibly specific on what the joint board is and is not able to do and that New York State has effectively signed off on that because they created the joint board specifically. This is not a situation where Erie County and Wyoming County decided to get together and approach the federal government to try and control the Buffalo Creek watershed. The, the New York State Legislature specifically made this joint board. You know, and I think that that so it's your view that played. New York State, New York State alone, is responsible for the structure? I, I mean, <laughs> that, the word responsible could be very broad there, Your Honor. Um, I'm, I think that New York State now owns the structure because it's permanently affixed to the waterbed that they own, yes. What, what did the agreement provide for between the federal government and the joint board? It provided for a, a number of things, specifically uh, what... Did they transfer ownership? That is the federal government transfer ownership? Yeah, the I mean, joint board or anyone else? I mean, I think we've all taken a stab at answering that question, Your Honor, and to be honest, my answer is not going to be any different than what they have said. Is your answer basically it's not us? Well, it's certainly not the Erie County Soil and Water Conservation District. We're not a party to that agreement. But you believe it's the state? I think it has to be the state because of where it is now located. And they didn't have to sign any agreement. It's just default. I don't, I, I mean, again, my position would be that they effectively did because they affirmatively created the joint board. There was nothing, you know, that, this, again, this was not irritating. They control the boards after their creation? I'm so sorry, ma'am. Do they control the boards after they create them? Do they direct State. them and tell them what to do? Well, certainly not, but I think, frankly, that would be impractical, which is why they've created this. So they create them, then they can't do anything about what they do or don't do, but then they're ultimately responsible because they created them. It, it was conceded that this is kind of circular. Well, it certainly is, but to pick up my point, they could pass another law. Well, to go back to the question another way, they are an independent entity that can sue and be sued, aren't they? I'm sorry, who is this? The, uh, the district. 
<laughs> my district? Yeah, the conservation oh, district. Oh, I mean, that's, that's black and white. That's section uh, 9 sub 9 says that uh, authorizes the district to be sued and be sued. So it undercuts, it, it somewhat undercuts the argument that, that somehow there's a vicarious ownership that runs through the joint board to the state, doesn't it? Perhaps in some respects, but I don't know why that would be the case here when, again, we're talking about a, a permanent structure that now exists in a navigable waterway. It's not exactly correct, is it, to say that the state created the joint board? Didn't what the state do is enact legislation that allowed two or more counties to, if they chose to do so, create a joint board? Well, I, I don't believe so, Your Honor, respectfully, because... The Erie County Soil and Water Conservation District already existed. The Wyoming County Soil and Water Conservation By District. choice of those counties, right? But, but when you read right? chapter 374. Just, just try that for a second. By choice of the counties, yes. The, the, the county could have chosen not to declare its well, certainly, district, right? But, but when had to take an affirmative act. But when 374 was written, they did exist. Right. The legislature knew that, and it says that they shall constitute a joint board. They didn't say that feel free to go now make a joint board, and here's what that joint board can do. It said, you now have a joint board. It exists. Here are its powers. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Good afternoon, if it pleases the court. Phil Barth on behalf of the Wyoming District. Um, I couldn't help listening about all the conversations about whether the state's an owner or not an owner. Uh, I, as was correctly pointed out, I can only say that my uh, client is not an owner. Uh, but there is a pending court of claims case, and perhaps that's the question that would be answered there as opposed to here. Uh, well, I mean, that case might wind up saying the state is not an owner, and then we have no owner. That's... Uh, that's an interesting question, Judge. I, I don't know what a court of claims judge is going to do. Um, but with respect um, to my client, uh, we're, our contention, we're seriously not an owner. Uh, we don't have any contracts. It's not even in our county. Um, the, we have no operating agreement. We, don't, we didn't build it. We don't fix it. We don't maintain it. Um, we are a separate entity from the joint board. I think that's been established that the joint board is its own entity, can make contracts, can engage in easements, uh, can be sued, can sue. Obviously, they've been sued. Um, so the Wyoming board has uh, no connection to the dam issue. And, and the part. joint board can hold title to property? It doesn't. It, it, I'm sorry, what? It does not. In my under, I'm, I represent Wyoming, so I, I can't speak for the joint board, but my understanding from this case is that the joint board does not own property, does not have any assets, does not have any employees, and essentially uses other people to do the work that it's contracted to do. There's no more questions. Thank you. I may address some of these points. In this case, there has never been any evidence or any finding regarding whether the Buffalo Creek in the area of the stams was before it was constructed or is now navigable. And certainly, as a matter of fact, it is not navigable. As people who tried to, you know, uh, do boating or tubing in the, in the vicinity of this dam died. And secondly, I would like to address the point about uh, before this accident, on a couple of occasions, the joint board, in fact, did seek permission to, to, uh, to uh, put up warnings. If you look at pages 87 and 9 to 91 of the record and page 93, and uh, as, as covered in our briefs, the, at, after the accident happened, the joint board, in fact, did erect, uh, or the joint board and or the Erie District did erect warnings uh, at various places uh, regarding the stam both on the dam itself and on property owned by West Seneca. And uh, I just think that overall that this agreement, and finally I would say that, you know, with uh, various things like utility poles and so forth, 
you know, they are not owned by the owners of the land. Rather, the utility gets the uh, gets an easement, and then they, they build a, and are considered to be the owner. And finally, regarding the Metromedia case, that this was a, considered to be a fixture, even though there, there was a, a, a time period involved that was uh, quite much shorter than involved in our case. But I don't think that that, really, the, that law didn't really matter. The Metromedia case is, the way it, uh, was decided more on the basis of what the parties intended. And here, the, the parties to the agreement intended that for the purposes of operation and maintenance, which to me, in, uh, which includes the right to place warnings, uh, that the uh, joint board was uh, an owner for those purposes. Thank you. Thank you.